Thank you for joining us on this uh, afternoon to this very challenging hour of the day and very challenging shape of a room. So we're going to try and make it as interactive as possible. I honestly believe that this is the most important session of this conference. This is my personal opinion, but at the end of the session, I'm going to ask you if you agree, and then you'll have an, a, an opportunity to express your own opinion, okay? So we're going to start um, talking about tribal divisions within the Jewish people. What does it mean exactly? Well, you can interpret it in many, uh, with using many words, but what we're going to try and focus today is the relationship between the State of Israel and world Jewry. As you all know, the State of Israel was established in order to strengthen and be a meaningful asset for the entire Jewish people. For years and years, this role had important meanings that were agreed upon everyone, all the parties. But as reality keeps shifting, those working assumptions are being challenged. And today we are experiencing a whole new world and we need to reinvent ourselves as a people and reinvent the relationship in order to keep it meaningful. So before I'm going to present our honorable speakers today, um, I want to share with you a song that was written by a 19 years old. And because the lyrics are so beautiful, I'm going to read it in Hebrew and then I'm going to translate it into English. The name of the song is El Atzipor. Shalom Rav Shuvech, Tzipor Anechmedet Me'erzot Achom El Chaloni, El Kolech Ki Arev Manafshi Kalata Bachoref Be'ozvech Me'oni. It's very high Hebrew and old. Ve'achai ha'ovdim ha'zoroim b'dimaa, ha'katsru b'rina ha'omer, mi iten li ever ve'afti el eretz b'yanetz ha'shaked ha'tomer. I'm reading it in English now, so some of it is going to be lost in translation, okay? Welcome upon your return, sweet bird, from the warm countries to my window. How my soul longs to hear your pleasant voice in winter when you leave my dwelling. Sing, tell, dear bird, from a land of wondrous distance, are the troubles and suffering great there in the warm and beautiful land. So this song was, of course, written by Bialik. He was a yeshiva student in Volozhin and wrote uh, to a bird, to a migrating bird, and asked her, how does the people of Zion are doing? Are they hanging in there? Um, he wrote it to a real bird because you really couldn't know what's going on there. Today, it's a very different world. We have a different bird that tells us things. It's called Twitter today. And those distances do not exist anymore. But just opening the session on a, an optimistic note, I uh, allow myself to say that today's challenges are built upon yesterday's successes. In many terms, we leave our ancestors' dream, which creates new challenges for our generation. So on this note, I'm going to open this session by presenting our speakers today. Mr. Barry Schrag, he's the president of CJP of Greater Boston's Washington Federation. Mr. Israel Maimon is the president of CEO of Israel Bonds. And Mr. Ronald Halbert is the executive director of Jewish Community Relationship Council of Greater Washington. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to try to make this discussion as fruitful as possible and engaging you, the audience. Uh, we have Tali around. It's going to give you a mic when, uh, the, when the Q&A section will, uh, will begin. And just as a starter, I would like to ask our speakers to tell a bit uh, about, uh, about themselves um, and about their organization activity in creating bridges within the Jewish people. I'm just going to start by telling you about myself. Uh, my name is Naama Klar. I'm the managing director of an Israeli nonprofit called the Reut Institute. We're a think and do tank trying to tackle Israel's strategic problem that are suffering from some sort of a blind spot or a neglect. Um, and I'm going to tell you more about how I see the relationship later on. Ronald, please. Ah, you have your own, actually. Let's see if it works. Hello? Can we open up all the mics? Hello? Hello, everybody. Uh, so my name is Ron Halber. It's been my privilege and honor to be the executive director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington for about 17 years. And I've been, this is my 20th year at the organization. And like most other JCRCs around the country, 
We're committed to the government relations aspects of our community securing money um, and trying to advocate for the public policy interest of our community. We also work on Holocaust education, interfaith work, social justice work, security. But today we're really focusing on, on Israel. And we are uh, one of the few uh, JCRCs in the country that has two people working full time on the local and state level. Actually, the director of our is Jennifer Raskus, who's here with us today. Um, and we have two people working full time developing grassroots support um, on the state and local level for the relationship between the United States and Israel, and, and also trying to uh, create education uh, and advocacy opportunities. I think one of the ways that we did it was very, very practical. I mean, I, my remarks are more about the global sort of um, interactions between the American Jewish community and, uh, and our Israeli brethren. But on a local level, and I think when it comes to Tachlis, we've done something very, very simple and effective. So Galia Masika Greenberg, who is right here in our audience, um, is the co-chair of our Israel um, of our Israel Commission to make sure that we have an authentic Israeli voice in our advocacy. Galia is an extremely successful local attorney, uh, grew up in Israel, uh, has lived in the United States for a st substantial time, and as a result, provides a very good face for our organization. So I think one of the practical steps um, that we have to do as organizations is actually get Israeli Americans, recruit them, go after them, and encourage them to join our ranks so that the special sauce that they bring to the American Jewish community uh, permeates throughout our organizational structures. Thank you, Hi, uh, my name is Israel Maimon, and uh, I, I feel like I'm the bridge. I'm Israeli. I lived all my life in Israel. I moved to the States a year ago to take this position of the president uh, of Israel Bond. So this issue is very important for me as an Israeli, but also as the president and CEO of Israel Bond. Israel Bond was established in 1951 by David Ben-Gurion exactly to connect the Jewish diaspora, the diaspora to the state of Israel, not only through contributions, because he understood that you cannot ask the wealthy Jews just to contribute, but really to invest in this startups that just was established in 1948. And so, since then, Israel Bonds is a huge, huge, huge success. Um, unfortunately, this, uh, this issue is not new. I was government secretary during the time of Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. I was sitting next to him three years. And during uh, his time, we initiated the Massa project. Are you aware of uh, Massa project? So at that time, Masa Project is a project that brings youngsters, young Jews, to long-term programs to the state of Israel. And we've done it, uh, me and Ellen Hoffman, the, then the manager of the education department, established that because we knew that the best way, but really the best, and maybe I shouldn't say it because I'm president of Israel Bonds about other organization, but the best way is to bring youngsters to Israel. Not only that they will know about Israel and to be more connected, and to long-term, by the way, to long-term programs, not uh, Taklit is doing great, Bethrat is doing really great, but when you're bringing the long, the, them to lo long-term, they are less assimilated, less intermarriage, become leaders of the community, involved in their community, so it's, it's, not an, it's not a new issue. And, um, but you spoke about our, the activities of the organization. Israel Bonds is doing every, or using every platform that exists in order to connect the Jews to Israel. But now I speak as an Israeli. It's a two, two ways. And I can say about myself, I knew not a lot of things about the Jewish communities outside of Israel before I was cabinet secretary. And this is the situation. Israel is, doesn't understand why, it's so imp why the issue of the conversion is so important. Israel is, doesn't understand why the Kotel issue is so important outside of Israel. So it's uh, something we should, we should understand that this is what I'm trying to do as, in my role, is to understand it's a two ways and not only dealing like Israelis tend to do, let's educate 
the Jewish communities. No, it's also educating the Israelis to understand what is Jewish community all about here. And I will continue later with our activities. Um, hi, I'm Barry Schrag. I'm uh, currently the president of the Combined Jewish Philanthropies, the Jewish Federation of Boston. Um, I know this is gonna come as a shock because I look so young, but I've been doing that for 30 years. <laughs> and uh, before that, uh, I've been working for the Jewish people since I got out of graduate school in 1970. Now, isn't that amazing when you think about it, really? Because, but that's because the work keeps me so young, really. It's, it's uh, not a, there's no stress in the job, and uh, it's basically a terrific uh, job. And as I've said to, uh, and this is gonna actually be a key to this teeny presentation, but um, there's only one requirement for my job. You gotta love the Jewish people. If you don't love the Jewish people, I highly recommend you get another job because it's gonna be really miserable and you know, you really, it's, it's that's not a joke, you, you really do. And actually the key to this relationship thing really is about love, more than it's about any kind of rationality or any kind of story you're gonna tell, any kind of propaganda that you're gonna use. It's essentially about reminding us that we love each other and that we need each other and that we can't survive without each other. Um, and, that, and that we're devoted to this God who also seems to be obsessed with loving the Jewish people. More than God demands love from the Jewish people, uh, God gives love to the Jewish people. It's an amazing story that we represent, and we have to represent that to the next generation. So I will say that in my obsession, in my craziness, which is clearly understood by all my colleagues who think I should be put away in some faraway jail cell or something, that, we, that, that this obsession is about creating these bridges. So when I first came to Boston, um, we were giving 50% of the money that we raised straight to the Jewish agency, no questions asked. And since then, we decided that every dime we raise, if it's gonna go to Israel, needs to go to projects that we've developed together. We picked Haifa as our community, and the Haifans and us, we work together to create the right kind of stuff that's helpful to them and helpful to us. It's not the rich guys dumping money on the poor Israelis, or the poor, every Israeli being Ari ben Kanan. Uh, those of you who remember who Ari ben Kanan is, but there's a whole, I don't, I asked that question the other day, half the room didn't know, and then I asked him who Vito Corleone was, they didn't know who he was either, it's really, it's, it's disturbing. Um, but the, but the, the idea that we really mean something to each other, it's the only thing that's gonna get us through this. So we now have so many opportunities for Mifgash. So like you said, Masa is one of those answers, and birthright is, an, birthright is massive. 35,000 North American kids a year, there are only 70,000, 80,000 Jewish births a year. It's half a generation, mostly the most alienated parts. If you'd asked them before they went, they would have nothing to do with Israel. By the way, 50% of our kids are now children of intermarriage, and the impact of a trip to Israel is even stronger for the children of intermarriage than for the children of in-marriage. All of a sudden, why it's hard to say, but breathing the air of Israel, but even more important, the mifgash with the soldiers on the bus is critical. It changes your life in fundamental ways. And that's what we've been dreaming about in terms of the identity of our kids. Something that would be immersive and that could really... Jewish education doesn't work for a five-year-old kid whose parents don't care about being Jewish, whose Hebrew school teacher doesn't care about being Jewish, who belongs to a synagogue that could frequently be just spiritually empty. How's that person going to know that they love the Jewish people? The answer is some kind of mifgash. Now they say, well, isn't it terrible that we have to wait until they're already you know, young adults before we see this amazing thing happen. I'd love to make it happen sooner, but right now this is what we got. We ought to take advantage of it. And, and we are not doomed to be drifting apart. It is completely in our hands. I love this uh, uh, idea from Rabbi Soloveitchik, who's with a great uh, uh, rabbinic presence and was in Boston. He said that uh, you could be driven uh, by, uh, uh, by fate uh, or, or you can be driven by destiny. So we don't have to accept our fate. We don't have to drift apart. We're different. We have different goals, different needs, all the rest of that. But this quality of love ought to be what ties us together. Thank you so much. Uh, I really want to build upon what you've uh, told us about your organization's work and see who sits with us today. I'm just going to stand up for a minute so I can see all of you. Uh, I'm going to ask you uh, three questions. and. You can only answer one. So please use your hands just as an acknowledgement. If what I'm saying is correct about you, please raise your hand, okay? Do you see yourself as an American Jew? Please raise your hand. Thank you so much. Keep it up. 
Have you been embarrassed by the annulment of the Kotel plan in June 25th this year? Please leave your hands up and then the other hand up too. If, if you felt embarrassment or anger or disappointment or pain or any other. So, okay, thank you. Do you see yourself as, as an Israeli American? The majority of the room, I think. Have you felt embarrassed by the annulment of the Kotel plan? Raise your other hand. Okay. A bit different. Now, and this is the hardest. Do you see yourself as an Israeli? Please raise your hand. Have you felt embarrassed by the annulment of the Kotel plan in June 25th? Please leave both your hands up if you're an Israeli that was embarrassed. Yeah, I think this is, um, it's just one thing that happened that tells us the things we have taken as granted for decades are starting to be challenged. Uh, and as leaders of the Jewish people, leaders of major Jewish organizations, uh, we would like to hear what you think about it or how do you see the new challenge that the Jewish people cohesiveness is facing today? Something that we always had challenges, it was never perfect. But something new, something that 10 years ago or five years ago wouldn't have been on our radar. We wouldn't have been had to, to deal with it. Ronald, please. So I just, before I get that, I just want to um, compliment what Barry said. In the end, you don't abandon family. And you would, you would never walk away from your child or your parent or, any, or anybody else because they, because you had extreme differences. You may argue. So the bottom line is we are, our people, American Jews and Israelis, are joined together by blood, heritage, culture, faith, you name it, and it's not an option to abandon each other. It's only an option how to, how, how to get back, maybe a good therapist, but how to get back to the table and, and, and to work together. So I think the, the way I would answer that question is that the problem is sim it's, it's, I'm sorry, I can't come up, it's not a new issue. It, it, it's an old issue with, with a new edge. It's the issue of unity. It's the issue of, of what is fraying the bonds of the relationship between American Jews and, and Israelis and why Israeli Americans are in a unique position, I think, to play a role in trying to better, uh, to better that. I think, first of all, American Jews need to do a better job in our own systems of supplemental education, youth groups, and, and, and as far as high school, teaching and getting American Jews to Israel. It's very important. I think Israelis have to reorient their educational system where the diaspora is not looked upon and not negated, and they understand that there is a vital, uh, uh, um, a, a vital um, successful, an honorable American Jewish community, which has approximately the same population as they do in Israel, and not just look upon it as a potential source, for example, for immigrants. I think American, uh, Israelis need to understand, Israelis need to understand that, um, that, that the relationship between the two states is nurtured by the political support that is given. I mean, most Israeli Jews have no idea about the merit of the organizational structure, and when Israelis come here, they're shocked at, at, at the vitality and the strength of the American Jewish community. And I also think that um, they have to understand that it's not just nurturing of APAC and fighting in the media, but it's also the incredible amount of philanthropy that goes to universities and hospitals and things like that. I think American Jews and Israeli Jews have to understand that it's no longer, we're on an equal playing field. It's, and, this is, and this is the essence of Zionism. This is what we wanted. Anybody who, American Jews who 40 years ago were giving money to Israel, sometimes they feel a little upset now that the Israelis speak to them on equal terms. But that's what we wanted. The, uh, that's the essence of Zionism. The idea was to make Israel a self-sufficient country that didn't have to come with a tin cup to American Jews, but to, but to make it so that the relationship of investing in Israel is, is what we want to do. So I think another point is that um, Israelis, um, is that American Jews have to understand that Israel is not a mitzvah project, okay? That, that, that while American Jews have a deep seat, many American Jews who care deeply about Israel, have a, a sense of despair and a sense of embarrassment when they see the occupation going on. What they don't 
understand often, and this is cost oversimplifying, but giving some broad generalities, is that 70% of Israelis in polls consistently have wanted to end the occupation, and 70% of Israelis have consistently believed that there's nobody there, for a, nobody to, that a Palestinian state is not a reality. So I urge on the part of American Jews a little more humility, that, we, that they turn from being uh, people trying to push the relationship politically, that they turn to educators, and that American Jews need to understand the best thing you can do as an American Jew when it comes to the, is the Israeli relationship to people you don't know is the same thing that Jennifer does when she speaks to kids who are going to high school. We've educated over 500 college high school students before they go to Israel to be activists, which is that you can be pro-Israel and still be critical of Israel, but that it's a complex situation. If it was so easy, Dennis Ross and Aaron Miller, Aaron Miller would be writing their memoirs about what a great piece, about how the peace accord went over. And, and American Jews also have to be willing not to, as they step into the rooms of left-wing politics, and where you're told that your Zionism uh, must mean you must step at the door to say, no, that's not acceptable. I am here to support LGBT rights. I'm here to support a woman's right to choose. I'm here to support a right, and you're going to either take me in my hole or you're not going to take me at all. But the reality is that American Jews on the left have an obligation not to negate their support of Israel in order to get acceptance, but to insist on it so that they see that it's part of our essence because if you insist enough and stand up for your values, eventually they will come around and adapt to the new reality. One minute, Israel. If I understand you correctly, you're talking about a new need to do Jewish engagement within Israel that is similar to maybe Israel engagement you guys have been doing for decades within the Jewish community here. Yes, we need Israeli Americans, and I was, it was interesting to see how many Israeli Americans stood up, uh, raised their hands when they talked about the Kotel issue. Before you came to the United States, you know, again, the famous, the synagogue you don't go to is orthodox. The synagogue you don't go to in America is reconstructionist, reform, conservative, orthodox. The reality is, is we need Israeli Americans. Only 4% of Israelis identify with one of the American denominations that are not orthodox in Israel. Of course it's not going to make any headway. There's no political base. There's no support. It's unimportant. Israeli Jews don't understand what we're upset about. But that's the job of the Israeli-American Council, and I'm tasking you guys that today. You have to be the ambassador. At what, you, know, you, you are Israeli-Americans, but you're also American Jews. And that dual identity puts you in an incredible position, perhaps better than anybody, to speak to your family in Israel and say, you know something? When Israeli rabbis say reformed Jews are Nazis or reformed Jews are coming, what do you expect American Jews to do? Say, thank you, we want to help you. You can't treat your family like garbage, and some of the rhetoric that's coming out of the rabbinate in Israel is incredibly divisive. I'm not saying about every rabbi, but it happens too often. And if you want American Jews to feel good about being Jewish, and from there flows their identity and their Israel activism, you know, there comes a point when the rabbis are saying, you know, it's, get, it's getting kind of hard to try to divert. We did a session um, with Rabbi Melissa Weintraub, who many of you may know about civil, and we brought 25 we brought 25 rabbis who agreed to come to a private session only if we wouldn't tell them who they were coming. But do you know how much difficulty they are having trying to deal and navigate the issue of Israel? Now, part of it is American Jews need to develop a little bit more of a backbone and not to be so apologetic. That's part of it, too. But part of it is like when my little eight-year-old is fighting with another kid. He provoked me. Well, tell some of the people in Israel, stop provoking American Jewry. It's not necessary to say reform Judaism is like Nazis. Keep your opinion to yourself. Do us a favor. Thank you. Uh, Israel, would you share with us how do you see the new challenge of the Jewish people cohesiveness? First, I, I will say again, it's not a new challenge. I'm sorry. But because now it's conversion and the, and the, the Kotel, but a few years ago it was two-state solution, and sometimes uh, it's uh, the left here in the in American jury <coughs> are against settlements. And now you can hear different uh, opinions, like how come you are not supporting the Judea and Samaria settlements? So it's not a new issue. It's uh, always, always will have disputes. But lot, like Nikki Haley said yesterday, and it's more, it's more even more obvious. Nikki Haley said that sometimes Israel and the United States are not in agreement. There are disputes about, for instance, settlements. 
but still, we are united. Uh, USA is our best ally. And it's even more obvious within the Jewish people. I'm, I'm telling the guys, some of the guys, after the two uh, resolutions of the government, some of the, guy, some of the American jury, not, not, it wasn't a flood, but I got emails saying, we don't want to, re to invest anymore in Israel bonds because of the decisions of the government. And I believe I found everyone. I called everyone because it cannot stay like they wrote it and it's great. We have, and this is what I told them, we have many flags around the world with crosses. We have many flags with crescents, but we have only one flag with Magen David Adon. With, uh, I'm sorry, Magen David Adon. <laughs> with the, with the uh, Magen David. Only one, because we have only one Jewish state. And this is something that you cannot punish through saying we'll not invest anymore with Israel bonds or we'll not donate anymore to Israel. Okay, try to convince the government. Try to influence in every way you can. So it's not, I, I don't think it's new issue. It's a, it's a new challenge. I think the new challenge is coming from a different angle. It was until 20 years ago, something like that, 15 years ago, it was obvious. Everyone were united around the existence of the state of Israel. Now that Israel is obvious, and many of uh, the youngsters doesn't know that the last, the last war, the big war that Israel was challenged by enemies from the outside was Yom Kippur. The Lebanon war was the thing that we chose. And the, the operations in Gaza, it's not existential threats. So the youngsters now are taking into, like it's obvious, I'm speaking about American jury, it's obvious. And the challenge is now is what's the story of the state of Israel? And first we'll have, we have to start with the fundamental. This is the only Jewish state. And then what, what we are trying to do in Israel bonds is really focusing, even though it's not efficient, let's say. We are working a lot in order to develop our new leadership. It's much more easier for us to sell one million of Israel bonds to a wealthy guy. It costs us a lot more to sell Israel bond of $36 to a young guy. But this is exactly what I think all of us should do, is to focus on the new generation. Focus on those who doesn't know what Israel meaning about, doesn't know about Israel, and even though it's less efficient from cost perspective, we are doing a lot on that, and we are bringing to delegations. I, the our directive is like 20% of each delegation we have to have uh, new leadership. In every event we're having, 20% is new leadership, and we sponsor them, we sponsor and subsidize them. And I think the focus should go to the next to, to the activities and projects within the new generation. So if I understand you correctly, the challenge is that things that weren't questioned before because of the miracle of the mere existence of the State of Israel and we're taking for granted cannot be taken for granted anymore. And you need to work closely with the next generation only to preserve the existing relationship. Is that true? Start with the basic meaning this is the only Jewish state that we have, and then go to, to projects that really aimed to the new, uh, to the next generation. Thank you. Mr. Shrek. Barry. Barry um, <laughs> so I, I think that I was being too glib with uh, my uh, John Lennon song, All You Need Is Love. <laughs> Uh, because uh, it's more complicated than that. And it's also more complicated than, as you know, than telling them that Israel is the only country that we've got in the whole world. It's a, uh, this is, uh, these are, um, and, and things, things are getting better and things are getting worse. Things are getting worse because of the combined uh, impact of intersectionality that every kid's gonna face on campus. The idea that among the worst oppressors in the world is Israel, and among the most oppressed people in the world are the Palestinians, a contention that makes no sense whatsoever. But 
it's not only believed, but it's becoming the conventional wisdom on many campuses. On the other hand, if you talk to um, Len Sachs, he'll tell you that actually uh, we've never been closer ever before. In other words, this generation in many ways looks more like a generation before them than uh, they, there are many things that are tying us together. You, by the way, 35,000 kids a year going on birthrights, not nothing. I mean, it's pretty big numbers. And if you believe, as I do, that the key to this thing is people getting to know each other and thinking of each other as human beings and not merely as political pawns on a chessboard, if it's really about that, then everything we all do ought to be aimed at this, at harnessing that energy, getting more people to Israel, making it more meaningful, all that technology stuff, all of our kids who are interested in that. Masa's got programs like that. We've got programs like that. Onward Israel has programs like that. There are many, many, many programs going on. We need to intensify them. And it's always been a mystery to me. I mean, to understand this, you have to know that, so I became part of this job uh, uh, you know, in 1970. And it was clear then that all forms of Jewish education, except maybe day schools, were failing miserably. The only thing that worked was camps and a trip to Israel. So instead of taking all the money that we were wasting on destroying kids' minds in Hebrew schools and putting it into travel to Israel, you know, we did what Einstein said was a sign of insanity. We kept doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Uh, and it didn't, obviously it didn't work. And then all of a sudden, not, by the way, not the kids themselves, not the young people themselves rising up with great ideas. Two really old guys. Forgive me, Charles, you know, uh, uh, and Michael. You know, they decided, hey, you know what? Only a trip to Israel is going to save us. Now we're going to make it free for everybody. And all of a sudden, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, then they ran out of money. And Sheldon, God bless him, comes in with, you know, $40 million a year to say any kid who wants to go to Israel can go. And all of a sudden, we have a potential revolution. But every, inst you know, every institution in America should be looking at those lists and saying, what can I do to bring them in more deeply? And instead, we sort of, federations for sure ignored it, and most institutions ignored it. They kept yelling about, what do we do for the next generation? There they are, lining up in twos and threes and fives and twenties, and we're not actually doing something with them. Anything we can do, send them back, engage them more. The more we know each other, the more this thing is going to work, but the other side is going to make it, and guess what? The reason this love thing is so important, guess what? The Palestinian narrative is not a bad narrative. It's not an awful narrative. I mean, I would say ours is better, but that's because I'm a Jew. I mean, this, the, the, the function of this as being uh, you know, actually related to the fact that we care about each other as family actually will matter. Uh, because until we have a two-state solution, which is not in the offing right away, you're gonna have two very opposing clashes and lots of people in the world are going to want to make us look like the bad guys in it. So that's a new thing. This intersectionality thing is a new thing. And the fact that assimilation has gone further than it's ever gone before is a relatively new thing. And the fact that 50% of our kids on campus are children of intermarriage is kind of a new thing. It grows every year. And yet, the truth is, is that a trip to Israel actually has an even deeper impact on a child of intermarriage than on a child of in married families. There is so much we can do if we're not stupid. But that means that even as we build our philanthropy in Israel, it's all got to be built, pretty much all got to be built on a partnership model. And, and that will help us to get through. If I understand you correctly, Barry, you're saying that things are so good, it's so easy to be a Jew here. Israel is in such a good situation. You don't really need to save it every day that this good situation by and large create an educational challenges of how to shape the Jewish identity of the next, next generation. Independent of that, shaping the Jewish identity of the next generation is a big challenge. I've spent my life trying to deal with this challenge. And um, as I say to Sheldon all the time, not in flattery, but every summer what he does with the birthright kids has, does more than I've done my entire professional life. He does it every summer. Because just taking those kids to Israel is a very big deal. Our job is to pick up on them and do something with them when they, when they come home. If we were truly focused on the Jewish identity of our kids and the members of the IAC were deeply concerned about the Jewish identity of their kids, and if we understood that we're bound together in this struggle, then we could begin to make progress in many, many, many different ways. We need each other. We're des we desperately need each other. Which also raises a question of how if Israel is such an important instrument in shaping Jewish identity, 
how would events like uh, the Kotel uh, plan annulment will affect the effectiveness of Israel well, as a... See, here, here's the deal, I think, on the Kotel thing. And, and I think that we're handling this wrong, but Mifgash could make it better. Mm -hmm. Israelis don't want to hear that we're insulted because our rabbis are being humiliated. They don't want to hear that. That's not their problem. What I want to do is show as many Israelis as possible how damaging the Rabbanut is to them, taking away their spiritual future, destroying their ability to have an honest relationship with God, destroying their ability to actually not just define themselves as, quote, secular, and, end quote, but to understand that they're deeply bound into a Jewish culture that has religious aspects. You can't mention the word religion to many Israelis just because the Rabbanut has made it has made the name of God into a curse in the land of Israel for many, many, many people. Only Israelis, when they are outraged enough, will do this not for our rabbis, but creating a kind of Judaism that will be an Israeli brand of Judaism that will be for them. They need to take it back from the Rabbanut. That not for our sake, but for their sake. And when we have hundreds of thousands of Israelis coming to America, we... we bring as many uh, Israelis, teachers, students, as part of the Haifa Mifkash, we bring them over. They see, when they, when they go to a reform synagogue, and you hear this many times from Shlichim and everything else, all of a sudden they realize what the rabbanut has been saying is a lie. You know what? A woman rabbi or a woman cantor is not a joke. It's a beautiful thing. It's a spiritual thing. And all of a sudden you can begin to have ideas about how you want to, you want to reshape your own sense of that and that will bring us closer together in so many different ways. I have to say, as an Israeli, working for an Israeli organization, that I do not believe that the revolution will start from Israelis need to re-understand their Jewish identity out of the context of the Rabbanut, but rather from re-understanding Zionism and, exp and asking what does it mean for Israel to be the national homeland of the entire Jewish people. When you understand that the Kotel should be something that strengthen all the Jews in the world, you understand that you have to manage this site differently. This is what I think, this is what I believe. <laughs> uh, but it's a very long process, as, uh, and as three of you referred to it, it's a non-issue in Israel today, and it's building into the bigger challenge of keeping the Jewish people unite. Uh, the next question I would like uh, to ask you to share is actually, what is your favorite working solution to the current problems? I think you've shared a little bit. I think the Haifa Boston partnership is a very good example, and the Mifugash is probably the most efficient instrument, even though it's only for the few and can't be applied for the masses yet. Uh, but all of our organization has this um, component of bringing the Jewish people together. So we would like to hear, what's your favorite program? What's your favorite plan for this? Let me answer it in two ways. One, I'll tell you what was a sort of a neat, very small micro program we did during Operation Protective Edge. Uh, we worked with friends of the IDF and we brought, we found out that between Washington and Baltimore, there were about 80, Israel, 80 American Jews who had made Aliyah to Israel who were, who were who were in the war, whether they were being deployed or involved in the military effort, and about 50 of the families came for a dinner where they all were able to get up at a microphone and just speak what it was like to be here while their kids were engaged in war abroad. So th that was a very touching, it was very simple, but, it was, but, but as what Barry was saying, this showed that we loved them, we cared them, and we were one community. So I'm gonna answer the second question about solutions. You know, sometimes, you know, in the Jewish community, we like to produce reams of paper. We are very good at task forces and, and committees and solutions, and sometimes the answers are actually in front of you, but people feel that if they don't go through the process, God forbid, they may come up with the wrong idea. Okay, we know trips to Israel work, okay? My son, my oldest child, our oldest child, Michelle and I, my wife, our oldest child is 15 years old. By the time he is 24, he should be in Israel three times. He should have been to Israel because he gets taken on some BBYO or some high school trip. He should go on his junior year abroad. Of course, he'll say to me, yeah, right, Dad, I'll do what I want, but that's, I'll deal with that. And, then, and, and that we all have to do. This is, the, this is the, 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 the penultimate goal. And the third is a trip on birthright. So 
you know, birthright is not an inoculation that's going to prevent anti that's going to prevent intermarriage, or it's going to prevent assimilation. And we should look at it, but it should be looked as experiential education that we know works better with young people. Young people, when, we, when many of us were in this room, we learned on a blackboard. Today, my kid can't disconnect his head from this, okay? And that's, and that's all of our children. They, they're, they're social media. We have to engage children on their level. If I can get my kid to Israel once before he's eligible for birthright, I, and that becomes his second trip, it becomes a reinforcing experience. There should be no limit to the amount of money. When we say, oh, there's no money, there's plenty of money in the Jewish community. That's nonsense. There's more money that, that, that has not been raised, that has been raised, and it can be raised. We need to get our kids to Israel, and we need to follow up with them. We need to, we need to track every Jewish child in our community like we watch our mutual funds. We have to look at them as an investment in our future. Every child, we should know the characteristics. Oh, being involved in, because for the 90% of our kids who don't go to day school, who don't go to day school, you, uh, you know, are they in the youth group? If they're not, why isn't there somebody at Federation or somebody at Caseworker who says to them, you know, you know, let me try to find it. We need to start, I've always believed that Federation, you'll probably kill me for this, but Federation needs a team of MSWs that follows every Jewish fa child and family and tries to draw them into the Jew. And their full-time job is that every Jewish family has a caseworker that tries to help them maintain their Jewish identity. If you want to get serious about it, let's put our money where our mouth is and stop fetching about assimilation. And look, the Jewish community is either going to go on three panels. There's three gears, right, when you drive a car? It's either we're either going to go neutral, which is not okay, backwards, which certainly sucks, or we're going to go forward. The Jewish genius, which produced is Israel, which produces the amazing strengths of the American diaspora, what are we afraid of? We should be embracing the future with confidence. We just have to have the Beit Seem to go there. <laughs> or Beit Ziyot or Beit Ziyot. Right, that I didn't get. But that's okay. Somebody will have to translate for me. F. <laughs> well, in Israel, Bonds, I, I would not say there is one that I prefer more than the others, but it's a very, very hard work, and we have to use all the tools. It's not only one, but I believe that the best is bringing people, whether youngsters or, I'm, I'm, I'm finding it every time that a new guy, a, a new Jew, 45-year-old, 50-year-old, came for the first time to Israel. And he is like, wow, I didn't see, I didn't understand. So my, my favorite one is still delegations to Israel. Delegation to Israel and the Mifgashim, when they meet Ethiopian community. When they're going to the Kotel and understand the problems surrounding the Kotel, the political issues, just by understanding that, when they're going and see what Israel Bond has, uh, has uh, brought, the development of the economy of Israel, the infrastructure and so on, this is the best tool, whether it's for uh, the Taglit, whether it's for Massa, or whether it's for 35 or 40 year, years old. I was last week in Panama and Mexico. I visited th those two communities. Panama. 12,000 Jews, Mexico 45,000 Jews, no assimilation. 99% of the Jews are connected to their synagogue, to the JCC, no assimilation. Excuse me? They are, they, they are all studying Hebrew. The, the, the kids, I visited the Bet um, uh, named Tarbut. They called it like that, Tarbut. And the, by the age of 13, Every kid is going to Israel. So it's not starting with birthright. They were not entitled. Now they are entitled to go on birthright in Massa. But they are starting with studying Hebrew, studying Israeli by, by Shlichim and Morim from Israel. And the whole culture surrounding the school is about Israel. And then on the age of 13 or 14, they are going the first time to Israel. I, I said that I was the first co-chair with Ellen Hoffman of Massa. And I fully agree, it's about partnership. I don't understand why Jewish organizations are not partnering with Birthright in order to get the data of the participants in, in Birthright and to do the follow-up. We are trying to do our best in Israel Bonds in do follow-ups with other organizations that are sending 
uh, youngsters to Israel. We are trying to partner with them. We get, if we can, put aside privacy, if we can get the data and make them more involved in the new leadership in Israel bonds. But this is something that you have to partner with all Jewish organization here. I don't, un really, I don't understand until now. I tried to do it when I was the co-chair of Massa. I didn't succeed, I'm sorry. But this is something that we have to, to use. The data is there. It's a waste because not every one of them, every one of them is... Uh, uh, Ronald said, we have to go and find everyone to make sure that we are making the follow-ups because we're going to lose some of them. So, uh, first of all, it's not s small. In other words, you know, you said it's, you know, a couple at a time, you know, it's, it's never going to be massive. Birthright's already massive. And, you know, when we send maybe 30 kids a year from many of our synagogues to Israel with their teachers, and Israel sends 30 of their kids from their schools back, all of a sudden you're affecting entire ecosystems of schools and synagogues and like that. So it spreads out, they're all networked, and it has rather massive potential implications, particularly for the young people going to Israel on Birthright or Massah or whatever, because they're all on Facebook and every other kind of thing that spreads the message. So it's very, very large, it's not small. It's one of the few things that we actually have, so you need to take that into account. And then there's a question of how committed you are to doing something. We are not, in Boston, we are not geniuses. Let, let me emphasize that. When IAC came to us and said, we want to strengthen the Federation, we didn't say, get out of our offices. You know why? Because we're not stupid. You don't have to be like a genius. And when we saw the numbers of kids coming back from birthright, and I went to every Hillel in the area, and I said, what are you doing to pick up on those kids? And they said, we have no money, we have no expertise, what birthright, we don't know what you're talking about. So we said, guess what? We will pay for a full-time person on every campus just to pick up those kids. And when people got word of what we were doing, the money came in. We're on 27 campuses now all over the country, full-time person on every campus, and there's plenty of money to do it. And now we're gonna do the same thing, in other words, we need to focus on this. This is not going to happen by magic, but making use of the. But if we do not do these things, things are going to get worse. They're not terrible now, but they could easily get much worse as the situation with intersectionality and other kind of stuff begins to worsen. And as assimilation, we can begin to cut down on assimilation. If it becomes more and more strong, it's going to mean that the love between Jews that could power this relationship will also begin to lessen. So, you know. I believe that Jewish education, Jewish learning is enormously important. I've worked on it all my life, but it needs to start with a sense of connection to the Jewish people. And without that, you're not likely to want to learn anything in Hebrew school or any other kind of school. So we have bigger opportunities now than we ever had. But if we screw it up, we're going to have to answer to the big guy upstairs, and he will not be pleased. So I just wanted to comment on one thing. Barry twice has used the term intersectionality. Does everybody know what that is? So, do we want maybe do you want to explain or do you want me to? Or? Don't ask. It's, <laughs> it's 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 basically the idea that that um, that many groups that feel marginalized in society are being held down by an oppressive system, and that everybody works together. So what you find is a lot of uh, a lot of um, groups on the extreme left joining forces with the same people. So you'll find like those who are protesting rape on campus will, will join with people who are protesting against the Israeli government, who will join against people who are, it's, it's this entire unification. And, and that's why one of the things that I was saying before about, main, about when we prepare our kids, if we don't prepare our children for Israel before they get to college, we're in trouble. Because they are going to be hit. Look, Jews like to be at the vanguard of every, in America, at the vanguard. You know, I have this a, 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 a retired judge who, you know, who talks, who always jokes about how the leading intellectual thought on the right is Jewish and how the leading intellectual thought on the left in American society is Jewish. So whenever this political conversation is taking place, it's really just an argument within the family. But, 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 but the reality is, is that today the pressure is coming from the left. And we need to make sure, first of all, we can't be afraid to say what it is because it won't be politically correct. And number two, we have to understand that the first time our children get to campus, they can't go, wow, Israel's being accused of all this. We have to give them opportunities to speak in an un... They, they can't be afraid to ask the questions. 
well, are the Palestinians really, did we really kick them out of Israel? You have to have that conversation with your children, and the Jewish resources must be there to have the open and honest conversation, because once they have that honest and open conversation, they will be fortified and be able to go to com campus with confidence, and they'll be able to be pro-Israel advocates. Opposition to Israel on campus makes kids shy away from their Judaism in public. And we have to take the steps now. It's, it's no longer enough to invest when kids get to college. We got to do it beforehand. Short, short story as an introduction to what I'm going to say. I met Rabbi Lau, Israel Meir Lau, you all know him. And he told me this story. A few days before Sharon got the stroke, Prime Minister Sharon got the stroke in 2006, he received a call just before Shabbat from Sharon. Hi, how are you? Sharon telling, is telling him this, this thing. I'm going for a Tzintur. How do you say Tzintur? Stent. Stent uh, operation within two, three days. But I'm calling you to speak about two issues that are troubling me, and I want to work with you after I'm recovering. One, the connection between Jewish diaspora to the state of Israel. And the second is the lack of knowledge within the youth about Jewish issues. He said in Israel there is a newspaper called Ma'ariv. In uh, Ma'ariv, also in Hebrew, it's the prayer in the evening. And the youth doesn't know that Ma'ariv is tefillah that you say in the evening. They know only that it's a newspaper in Israel. Those two things are troubling, troubling me as Prime Minister, and I want, after my recovery, to work with you and how to address them. And he was amazed until today, of course, he said, um, of course, we'll meet and uh, I'm willing to do it, and those, this meeting didn't happen. But now, Israel Meir Lao sees it, and I'm seeing it, as like a spiritual will of Prime Minister Sharon of connecting the diaspora to the state of Israel. But what, what I'm trying to say, we didn't touch that angle. It's partnering also with the state of Israel. And the state of Israel is a big word, but in the past, leaders like Ben-Gurion, Peres, Sharon, that were born before the Israel was established, knew a lot about the Jewish communities, knew a lot about the challenges of Jewish community. They stayed here, they lived in your places. Now, politicians in Israel doesn't know enough. And I think what we should do is not give up. Even though some of here, the left side, doesn't like all our politicians, still you have to invite them. Still you have to speak with them. And still you have to partner, you, to, um, you have to make me gashimitam and explain with them. Because I feel, 10 years after I, it's now 10 years after I finished as government secretary, the, the members of parliament, the ministers, and the leadership in Israel doesn't know enough and is maybe, I will not say it's not committed to the continuity of the Jewish people, but I feel it's a less urgent need of them to understand it. And we shouldn't give up. So you as leaders of your organization has to put the influence and whatever you could do, not through punishment, not through boycotting Israel, but through those mifgashim, with the government in raising the, in, in speaking about the challenges and in working. I don't know if you know, but uh, Taglit, put aside how much money Sheldon, God bless him, is doing, but the government of Israel is matching it. And the government of Israel, uh, during rough time, rough economic times, didn't cut the budget for that. And the same with, with the Massa project. The government is putting half, half, uh, 50 percent of the budget for that. So we, could, we should work, the Israeli Jews here and the, uh, uh, the uh, diaspora as a general, with the government and not give up and say, okay, they don't understand or they're too right or too lefty. And we have to face them with those challenges and demand that they will be part of keeping the continuity of the Jewish people. So we've just touched two other challenges that you haven't mentioned in the first round. The first one is that the political atmosphere has altered a lot in the last decade, and it challenges the context of how education about Israel within the Jewish community can take place. You cannot ignore things that you could have 
years ago, and questions or maybe even criticism that used to be outside of the camp, we're starting to hear it within the Jewish congregation now. This is the first. And the second is that the sense of Jewish peoplehood for Israelis that used to be taken for granted for my grandparents, for instance. My grandfather came to Israel, but his brother ended up in Argentina. And it's the story of each and every Jewish family in the world back then. They had the sense of a Jewish people. And now I'm a third generation. And talking about the Jewish people in Israel, it's not even an issue. It's not on the agenda. It's not on the priorities. And it's not coming from some sort of an evilness or ignorance. It's just an old mindset that hasn't been updated for s several decades. So I think those are also two challenges that, are, uh, that we have to face in order to keep the Jewish people cohesiveness. Now, before my closing remarks and closing question, I want to open the floor for some Q&As. So Tali has the microphones, and uh, let's start with the one that stands just next to you. Yeah. Please stand. Uh, my name is Jennifer Schur. I represent Gesher Jewish Day School in Fairfax, Virginia. Um, so it's great to talk about birthright. I'm married to a birthright alumni. I'm married to a past AAPI president. We're affiliated. Okay, But we're not talking about two big elephants in the room. One is perpetual consumer Judaism. And what does that look like? Okay, consumer Judaism is we have t these college students who they go on birthright and then they come back and they literally do not want to pay for anything, ever. Okay, so they come back and we want to talk about like how do we train them to pay it forward, but they, they want to, oh, you want to send your kids to day school? Oh, but I don't want to pay for that, right? At any level, forget if it's subsidized or not. Just use a question mark at the end and yeah. <laughs> Let's take Sorry. three questions and then our speakers can choose what they want to answer. So and next question. Ah, you I'll, have. I'll, okay. I will. I will post it with. What role, okay, for, does the day school life play in this dynamic that we're talking about? Forget about price tag, okay. But if we're talking about really engaging the youth from when you, you engage the whole family and saying birthright Israel, well, we do it because we don't have anything else yet, but we actually have an entire system. So how do we then throw more money at that system, make that more accessible? Thank you. Thank you. So you're next. Hi. We have someone right here. Hi, I'm Shira, and I'm from San Diego. Hi, Ron. I taught your child at the JCC in Rockville. So you said... And you, um, and you survived. Uh, <laughs> still here, survived. still teaching. Um, I'm a teacher at the San Diego Jewish Academy uh, for the past few years, and... Myself, I have three girls. I cannot afford to send my children to a Jewish day school. It's very expensive. So my question is, if we want to build Jewish identity, we should start with the Jewish day schools. How can we donate money, bring money to the Jewish day schools so that all the Jewish people who are interested in sending their kids and building their Jewish identity are able to afford I have three girls. I Thank cannot you. afford That's it. That's a really easy one. They can just like answer it in a can minute. Can they give me a check? <laughs> <laughs> and a third question before we give them an opportunity to, to answer. Uh, Monica. Hi, that's all. Yeah. Hi, my name is Monica. I'm the CEO of Science Abroad. It's an organization that connects Israeli scientists all over the world to Israel and support their return to Israel. And I see another elephant in the room. And the, this elephant, you mentioned at Nama before, but the elephant is the ignorance of Israelis about diaspora. You all sp uh, po uh, uh, spoke about birthright, which is very important, bringing students to Israel and educate them about Israel. But you didn't speak enough, for my opinion, about how to educate Israelis about diaspora. And our people, the Israeli scientists who come abroad, they come for a temporary time. Uh, most of them for a fellowship or postdoc fellowship. So they have a dual role here. And I, my question to you, if you are aware of that role, and the role is that uh, in, when they come here to the state, they bring Israel here to the communities. They speak about Israel, they bring the, the, the research. But, they, but when they come home back to Israel, they bring your community back home. They bring the habits, they bring the, the, the thinking about pluralism. And I can say, I say about myself, I used to be a Jewish agency, Shlicha. I think when I came to the state, I was secular. I didn't know anything about Judaism in diaspora. And as we say, the Shlichim said, I came, I came to the state Israeli, I became back Jew. Because I brought back home all my uh, knowledge about uh, the uh, Judaism in the diaspora. 
I would like to know about the Federation. Are you de doing any efforts to, to bring those Israelis who come here for temporary time, educate them, so that when they come back home, they'll be your ambassadors? Thank you. I'm going to give them an opportunity to answer, and then we'll see. We'll time it for any more questions. So uh, first, that's absolutely right. I mean, and in, in a way, um, in terms of the temporary people coming back and forth, that's where the IAC can play an enormous role, and they have to be enabled to do that. But for the day-to-day, -day, all of our work in Israel is two-way. In other words, we'll send 30 or 40 kids from our schools to Israel, we'll take 30 or 40 kids from their schools and take them to the United States. We'll take their parents, we'll take their teachers. It's certainly a two-way proposition as we try to, uh, to, to build exactly that bridge. University of Haifa just started a program about training teachers to be able to interpret to their students something about what American Jewish life is like. So that's right on target, and there are lots of ways that we can do it, and the IAC has a tremendous role to play. So um, I almost want to say, when you're talking about day schools, do you know who you're talking to? Day schools have been the heart of my life. You know, my kids went to day school, my grandchildren are going to day school, I went to day school. It's been our, among our highest priorities. This is a, this, the cost of day schools is a very deep problem. Do the math. It's $30,000, $40,000 a year per kid. If we gave $3,000 a kid to all the kids in our system right now, it would break the Federation altogether, it would take all of our money, and it would have a minuscule impact on the number of kids who could afford to have a day school education. It's, it's deep, it's hugely expensive. And I'm all for finding every way to do it. And in a way, if you wanna know that person who is connected to every Jew and who goes out there and tries to convince them, that's, you know, I only have 250,000 Jews, but that's been my primary job, is to try to convince every single Jew to maximize their kid's Jewish education. And you know what, actually, it has an impact. Because if we only had the parents who could afford it sending their kids to day school, we would triple the number of kids in day school, only the ones that can afford it, who are sending their kids to super expensive private schools. If we could get that, and why aren't they? It's because they have no sense of Jewish identity. So this thing about Jewish identity and sending them to Israel and loving the Jewish people and loving Israel, this is circular stuff. It's it mutually reinforcing. Until there's love of the Jewish people, you're not gonna spend 35 cents on your kid's Jewish education. You've gotta believe it's important. That's why we do a lot, in addition to the day schools, we do a lot of adult learning because we think if the parents can actually understand the beauty of this, they'll sacrifice more for the sake of their, of their children. Jewish parents sacrifice plenty for the sake of their children. The problem is, is that they never saw this day school thing as being that important. One of the best things we did was to do enough adult learnings so that we opened a reform movement day school, which is now one of the most successful day schools in our city, taking many high status people who then, who then impact other people who want to send their kids to day school. So it has to do with status, it has to do with getting the right people to decide to send their kids to day school, it has to do with having options for less committed Jewish people, it has to do with increasing adult learning, increasing love of the Jewish people, increasing all of that, but we know that the end result here is not just a birthright experience, it's figuring out how you draw those young people into more intensive forms of Jewish learning so that someday they'll want their kids and be willing to sacrifice to have their kids go. To think about this, if, you know, saying this is, um, it's not heresy, let's just say it's the plain truth. If you wanna have a big impact on the cost of day school education, then we better start thinking about encouraging government funds for day schools. It's the only place the money's gonna come from. Now, I'm not saying that, I'm not risking my life here by saying that I when think When you're that's saying the, government, you refer to the, which government? State and federal. And, and you know, and there are forces in the federal government right now that would like to do, to do I that. I might add that the Israeli government might play a significant role in the I don't know, you know, we don't wanna bankrupt them either. But, but, the, but you know, the, 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 thing about the, U, the thing about the U.S. government is, is that our taxes are already paying for an education that many of our kids aren't accessing. So, but that's, that's, a, that's a third rail of American Jewish politics. It's the church-state thing and all the rest of that. But if we really want to consider this, we've got to consider everything, because $40,000 a year per kid, it's going to be hard to raise enough money under any circumstances to make much of an impact. Thank you, Barry. Anything to add? Okay, so just as a, as a closing uh, remark, because um, we have to finish, unfortunately, I think we've started a really heavy conversation. Talking about our difficulties is not a weakness. I 
I think it's a strength for us as a people. I think that there is ripeness in Israel and outside of Israel today. And I would like just to, to conclude with a story. Uh, do you know why we have Hakafot Shniot, the second circles with the scroll of Torah at the end of Sukkot? Do you know why we have this costume? When did it start? No one? Yaakov? It started because it's the day when the, in the diaspora they're circling with the Sefer Torah. So to emphasize our brothers outside of Israel, we've started doing it in the end of the Chag in Israel. I spent the last Chag in a city in Argentina called Cordova, and then they took out the, the scrolls of, of Torah and danced with it on the first night. So I asked the community, why are you doing that? And they said, in Israel they're dancing with the scroll of Torah and here we're not gonna dance. We wanna emphasize with our brothers. So this is just one little ritual that for years and years had brought us together, had made us recognize the other, the other part of the family that is not with us today. I believe that my generation, and excuse me for emphasize the generational gap, has a really big challenge in reinventing those rituals that will bring us together. It's a lifetime mission. I myself are very optimistic. Um, I want to thank our speakers today and the audience for being with us. Have a lovely afternoon.